good morning, Aerospace Valley. My name's Randy Gordon. I go by Laz, and I am the Vice Wing Commander out here at Edwards Air Force Base. And I wanted to kind of take a few moments, just kind of share a little bit of the story with all the kids that are out there in Aerospace Valley and are thinking about a career in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. And what I really wanted to let you know is that you are no different than what I was at your age. When I was a, you know, very, very young, I, I grew up in upstate New York in a really, really rural part of New York in a trailer park of all places. Um, all the things that people said about me, I mean, sometimes the slang is that you're trailer trash, you're, you're poor, you're, you're no good. Um, I heard all of that. I, that was especially true, especially growing up as a minority and wanting to really be involved in airplanes and aerospace, but looking around and not seeing anyone that really looked like me or was a good model or, or anything else, and then being surrounded kind of in an environment where just wanting to leave the town uh, and go off and do something different was really, really weird and bizarre. Most of the folks that I grew up with, they were born, they lived out their whole lives, and in some cases died, and they never left more than about 100 and 150 miles or so for that entire thing. So for me, the idea of wanting to branch out and to go see something different was, was really strange and bizarre. Although I grew up very, very poor, um, I did grow up right next to an airport and I saw airplanes flying over all the time. And I would look up and I would go, gee, how does that work? Uh, where do those people come from? How do you get to do that? And I was really excited by airplanes, but I was also really terrified because I didn't know any pilots. Uh, I, as though I, I knew I wanted to be a pilot, I, I didn't think I had it, what it took to do that. We certainly didn't have the wealth to, to go do that. So I was kind of stuck in this world of, gee, I'm really interested in STEM, I'm really interested in aerospace, but I don't have anyone around me that can help me kind of get there. And I didn't believe in myself in terms of how to go do that. That all changed one night when I got a chance to go see uh, a lady named Mae Jemison who, if you don't know, was the first African-American female uh, to fly in space. So she's an astronaut, but she was more than an astronaut. She was a dancer, she was a medical doctor, did a lot of work in Africa um, to help out communities there. Um, she grew up in Alabama. And when I heard her story and I got a chance to meet her, I realized that not only was this the coolest, you know, for, for, forget men or women, th th this was the coolest person that I ever got a chance to meet. And while I'm listening to her presentation, she said something which I always remembered, and it's kept me going through life, and so I give this to you. She said, never be the one to tell yourself no. Always make those guys tell you no. In other words, if there's something that you really want to go after, go for it. Just go do it. And you'll be surprised, right? I, I came out of that, that presentation thinking, well, I still might fail at this but I'm gonna give it a shot because my dream was always to go to the Air Force Academy so that I could be a pilot. And so I actually applied the very next day to the Air Force Academy and lo and behold, got accepted to a school that I thought never would have accepted me in the first place and so therefore I wasn't going to apply. And that started this career path where I got a chance to study aerospace engineering, I got a chance to earn a, a liberal arts PhD, I got a chance to work at a place called DARPA and I got a chance to fly all these different airplanes that you see kind of sitting behind me uh, and become not only a fighter pilot but then to become a fighter test pilot and it's all because someone told me to have courage in myself and to believe uh, and so I'm always grateful to her for giving that confidence to me and I've always looked at it as kind of my responsibility to share that with others and so that's what I wanted to do with you guys today is that you're seeing our Edwards Air Force Base STEM and what you're really seeing is you're seeing a group of professionals, men, women, all different races, all different backgrounds, all different financial wealth statuses, uh, but we all come together here because we believe in something larger than ourselves. We believe in serving this team, we believe in serving national security, and we're all super nerds who are super in love with technology, and here you get a chance to do that. One of the big misconceptions of Edwards Air Force Base is that this place is all military, that if you wanted to come be a part of Edwards, that you gotta go to a place like the Air Force Academy, you gotta be a commissioned officer, you gotta wear this uniform and do the military lifestyle. For some of us, that's the path that we chose, but believe it or not, here at Edwards, uh, easily you know, thousands of people that work out here, out of our 11,000, thousands of those people are civilians who 
uh, believed in STEM, believed in national security, and even though they don't necessarily wear the uniform, we consider them, quote unquote, big A airmen, uh, because we need them to be able to do our jobs. So when you're seeing our videos and you're seeing the presentations, keep an eyeball out for that because you'll see a lot of people that tend to look a lot like you do, um, doing some really amazing cool things in the aerospace valley and living on the forefront of technology. So we wanted to welcome you. We wanted to say thanks for tuning in for the Hybrid Air Show. We wanted to say truly and honestly, if you believe in STEM, go for it. Don't let your financial status, don't let your gender background, don't let your racial background, don't let any of that stuff get in the way for whoever you are, because if you want to go after it, it's completely possible. The simple fact that I get to serve here with these wings, wearing that patch, with this rank, and serve with just some amazing Americans that just make me really proud to be a part of this nation and to work on this technology. Um, all of that is testament to the fact that if I could be here, so can you. So think about that as you're watching our airplanes and please interact with us on social media and we look forward to chatting with you some more. Again, I'm Randy Gordon, I go by Laz and uh, I'm proud to serve as your Vice Wing Commander for Edwards Air Force Base. Twenty nineteen for the CTF, uh, I think, was a little bit kind of like the night before Christmas, if you will. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, preparation and anticipation in twenty nineteen. We started off kind of shaky, so three of our flyable jets went down because of intake issues that we had to send them all back to the depot to get repaired. So that was a time when, frankly, I think a lot of the enterprise expected the test would more or less grind to a halt, and. Really, as you look back at the history of the programs that we did, you really can't even see any impact of the fact that we had zero flyable jets here at the CTF. And that speaks to uh, really the willingness of the team to work past issues to try and find creative solutions. Once those jets got back to the CTF, we kind of got into uh, flight sciences testing for the first time in a long time at the CTF. I think about a decade it's been since we've done uh, legitimate flight sciences testing. So we had the loads and camera test plan uh, that we executed on aircraft 132 uh, to expand the envelope of the Raptor with the wingtip camera pods. And like I said, that's all kind of preparation and anticipation for some big programs coming up in the future here. We've had a couple of highlights this year in terms of programs that we're sending out to the operational Air Force. One of those is Update 6, bringing modernized secure communications to the warfighter. And that brings a lot of really good, what we call PVI, pilot vehicle interface. And it really makes the pilot's task, once they're flying, a lot easier. So Update 6 is gonna deploy along with 32B, so that's a major hardware and software modification uh, that is going to bring the current uh, combat jets into a, basically a new arena with some additional capability. Another significant program is the KC-46 testing that we did. Adding a new tanker to our Arsenal of our ability to get gas in a combat environment is a significant plus to the warfighter. Last year we added KC-30, this year we're adding KC-46 through the, the hard efforts of the test team. Qualification with the KC-46 was a huge muscle movement and a big priority for the Air Force. Um, so now the F-22 has another tanker that it's able to use for uh, high threat theater, so that was a big accomplishment for the CTF in 2019. One of the major things we did at the CTF this year was participate in Orange Flag. Orange Flag is a multi-platform, multi-domain test event, and the F-22 was one of the central players in Orange Flag itself. We bring in players from all across the United States, from operational tests, developmental tests, and the operational world, and we get them in the same environment, in a near-peer threat environment, and we see how the systems are going to perform. We had uh, three different test programs executed on a single sortie that took a lot of uh, innovation, a lot of ingenuity, and frankly, a lot of flexibility in the part of the team to be able to execute uh, those different programs, keep all the, the balls moving down the track uh, without any loss of efficiency. The CTF is a really unique place. We have a contractor team mixed with government civilians, mixed with active duty Air Force. 
the instrumentation folks who really manage the unique uh, instrumentation that we have on our aircraft uh, that are truly one of a kind. Uh, our engineering team is world class. Uh, the maintainers that keep the aircraft flying on a day-to-day -day basis, these are really unique aircraft that take a lot of work uh, to get them flying. Yeah, so you always hear the uh, term purple team, uh, especially for me and my flight test engineers. Uh, we are maybe more of the green team, right, because people wear the flight suits and without seeing the rank on their shoulders, you can't tell if anybody is a civilian government contractor, right? We all do the same job. We all are highly dedicated to the mission here, which is pushing combat capability out to the warfighter at the speed of relevance. So what I think makes the CTF special is really the family atmosphere. It's something that I treasure from my time here at the CTF between the different assignments that I've had. Uh, it really feels like home. And I think that feels that way to a lot of people. I know we went through some tragedy this year and really seeing the different groups come together, support each other and build each other up was very inspiring to see. I think the biggest mindset that we have here at the CTF is ensuring that everything we do is focused on delivering combat capability to the warfighter at the speed of relevance. And this squadron and CTF really does a fantastic job doing their piece of the puzzle so that when execution comes, everything is working right. So it's really a pleasure to work with this team. Well, overseeing a CTF like this as a commander is an incredibly humbling experience. Nothing reminds you of uh, your inadequacies and being surrounded by people that you look up to and you respect at how incredible of a job they're doing every day. It's pretty awesome to get to work with high-speed individuals no matter where they come from, uh, with everybody working towards that same goal and um, having safe, secure, effective, and efficient flight tests as their single mission. So how does what we're doing uh, impact the warfighter? I tell you, every day we are developing combat capability that will be used on night one of the war whenever and wherever it kicks off. We know that we've had American air dominance for some time, but we also know that the world is changing and that we're in a world of great power competition in which we cannot take this American air dominance for granted. It's the people here of the CTF that are working to make that a reality, to make us continue to be the most lethal fighting force on the planet, and that will help ensure uh, American air dominance for years to come. Everybody works together, does their job in the background so that when that day comes, the test execution needs to happen. Uh, all the pieces come together and then we go and execute flight test as if it was something that was uh, easy to do. So if I had one message for the CTF, it would be the work you are doing every day is critical to maintaining our advantage as a country. General Tyker talks about uh, supporting the warfighter and that is uh, critical, that is indeed our primary goal, but we are also in effect warfighters ourselves in that the technology that we are acquiring and the capabilities that we are developing are having a strategic impact just by their mere presence. So the work that we are doing to develop these game-changing capabilities is having an effect right now, not just five and 10 years down the road, but indeed right now. So thank you for your amazing efforts every day in making that a reality. Within brief parameters, you have a green range.
have always been civilians in the Air Force, right there with us, side by side, at home and deployed. We wore the uniform, and they didn't. But they took that oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Chances are, that oath means more to them than anybody can imagine. We're all part of the team. They could have taken their skills anywhere, but they brought them to the Air Force. Some of them have been here longer than us, and they'll be here when we've moved on. They're the ones with lifetimes of experience. They're the ones with fresh-faced enthusiasm, patriotism. They're the ones who are here to be part of something bigger than themselves, to serve their country and lead in any way they can. Are they airmen? Some are separated or retired. Some came in through an intern program or basic federal employment opportunity. Some were Marines, Army, Navy, Coast Guard. A lot of them do what we do, better. They do it for the same reason we do, country. A team is not the people you work with. A team is the people you trust. Ask any airman what the civilian's purpose in the Air Force is, and you might hear that civilians are here to provide know-how and support. And just about every airman would tell you that civilians aren't just part of the team, they're a critical part of the team. So think about this. If everybody on a team supports each other, how are we supporting them? Simple, with our respect. This is for all you civilians watching this. The electricians, the defenders, engineers, childcare, instructors, logistics, finance, human resources, all 180,000 men and women without whom this Air Force would grind to a halt in a split second. You, our civilians. You may not stand at attention, but you stand for everything that is good and right about this country. You may not wear the uniform, but you do wear the mission. You are part of this team. You embody our core values, and there's such a thing as respect. We are never required to salute civilians, but we are allowed to. So we salute you. We thank you. And to every single one of you, we say this. Aim high, Airman. Test Engineering Group is made up of about 750 professionals, civilians and military, who execute the mission of the 412 test wing. Edwards is a really unique place to come to work every day. This is where PowerPoint slides become air power. We provide actionable information to the warfighter. The Test Engineering Group is made up of five test squadrons. We have the 812th Aircraft Instrumentation Test Squadron, and they uh, make sure that we can collect the data. I support the instrumentation that goes on the aircraft. Whenever anything breaks, we have to go out there and fix it. I think the most exciting thing about working here is being able to see a design or an idea come to life. From the approval process to watching it get fabricated and then later seeing it fly on airplanes is really cool, and it's really exciting to be a part of that. So all the components that we design and install are used to collect data. The test squadron is responsible for flight sciences, the safety of flight type of information is the 773rd test squadron. You see the data, you know, it can be a real-time call. So it's, I enjoy having that kind of uh, decision-making ability and the pressure to get it done right the first time. We have the range squadron, uh, which does all of the execution and, and basically gathers all the data for all the testing that we do. All sorts of different kind of missions. We, we do laser hops, we do things on the ground, we do things with drones, we do things with UAVs. Um, so we get to work with just about anything that you can think of.
the 812th Test Support Squadron, which provides training and basically statistical analysis for tests. I love coding and I love doing statistical analyses, so I, I could do what I love all day. I just happen to be applying it to aircraft and to various platforms here on base. It's fascinating, it's cutting edge. There's a lot of new material and new areas that we're trying to develop statistically as well as with engineering, so it's fascinating to be on the, the cutting edge of new techniques and being able to apply what I love every day. We have the 775th Test Squadron, which is responsible for avionics and weapon system integration testing. I'm a tactical data link engineer for the 775th Test Squadron. I work at the 419th Flight Test Squadron. That's where the B-1, the B-2, and the B-52 bombers reside. My job is, is each day is so different. One day I can be writing a B-2 test plan, and another day you can be supporting a B-52 flight test or a proficiency test. Another day you could be just doing data analysis all day and looking at all the messages sent and received or looking at aircraft recorded video of their screens and what the pilots see. That variation keeps every day unique and different. We provide actionable, defensible, statistically relevant information to decision makers throughout the Air Force and the Department of Defense. Aircraft win the war! Welcome to Plant 42. If it's cool and it flies, I guarantee it started right here on the plant. Let's go see the airmen that made it possible. Hey, thanks for visiting Plant 42, the Downtown Air Force. See you next time. Target two. Target two, go ahead. We're all clear.
With every test that is being performed at Edwards Air Force Base, there is data being collected. It doesn't matter the type of mission or aircraft. These are the numbers that don't lie. It is the job of the 812 Test Support Squadron Statistical Methods flight to crunch those numbers and provide feedback to the engineers and testers to ensure that the warfighter has the best tools in the fastest and safest manner. A warfighter would love to get a perfect product every time, um, but they also need to get a product when it's timely. And without our statisticians helping us understand the risk associated with collecting um, some degree less than all data, um, we're able to provide that product to the warfighter sooner. My name is Wendy Peterson. I'm the director for the 812 Test Support Squadron. And we are a family of five very diverse flights. One of the five flights within our squadron is called the Statistical Methods Flight. And for every combined test force at Edwards Air Force Base, our statisticians provide the test teams with a better understanding of uh, the uncertainty involved with the data that they collect. Science, technology, engineering, and math, we are doing a lot of, the core thing is applied engineering. We are integrating systems onto aircraft or we are testing brand new aircraft and determining sort of the what is the edge of their performance? How well do they work? How fast do they fly? How far can they go? How accurate are their sensors? Uh, there isn't a day where you're not thinking in a mathematical or scientific sense. You know, it's not doing initial research on trying to determine, you know, what is the strength of gravity on Earth, but there is the science of a particular very high-tech sensor operates in a very specific manner. And we want to know, so just how good is it? So our tests are set up to try to determine, you know, what is the line of it can do this, but it can't do that. Having the scientific mindset is an absolute plus. That's everything that we do is a report. That's sort of our main final product is knowledge. You know, this is what we know about the system as we tested it. It is science career eye. It is, that is what the job is. You're constantly learning about new things that are, that are sort of on the frontier of military technology which is a, kind of a fascinating and interesting uh, thing to come and learn about. I will say that the, the workforce is it's a great place to work because everything is done as part of the team. Very rarely are you doing something on your own in your own cube. You're constantly in some sort of interaction, working with someone else to sort of handle a problem or work past an issue. There's a, a strong sense of team. People think statistics, they just think numbers, they think nerds, they think spreadsheets. In one sense, yes, that is true. But statistics is never in a vacuum. It's, it's all, it, it is the applied of applied mathematics. Whether it's business, technology, sociology, politics, often when you're measuring things, they aren't certain. And so probability and statistics becomes an aspect of the knowledge of whatever field you're in. What I would say to a high schooler, as far as like, if you're considering statistics, what is kind of cool about it is, it is a very applied math. Even though you may be into something else, engineering, sociology, math, statistics is kind of a brother that's going to kind of connect it. It's something to consider if, if math is your cup of tea, statistics is going to be uh, uh, right up your alley. Uh, it's a privilege to serve and support the members of the A12 Test Support Squadron to support the airmen here at Edwards Air Force Base, or as we like to call it, Tikatatu. I came to a flight test from the F-15C model community. As a young fighter pilot, when I started there, I was amongst what I would consider the Olympians of air superiority. An outstanding airplane with a great mission and people who were exceptionally well trained. But I always wondered, what's the next front? What's the new capability? What's the new tech coming out so that we can create that same cadre of people for the next generation of airplanes and capabilities? Well, what happens when we're looking at things like artificial intelligence, like machine learning and big data, or all types of advancements in hypersonics and stealth? This is where test comes in, that idea of being able to look at the future and to be able to figure out how to actually validate that it actually works and then how do you field that to the warfighter. That's a challenging problem that is continuously exciting and engaging and I like the fact that we do that here.
always on the forefront of the latest and greatest technology. And right now is a revolutionary shift. Edwards Air Force Base, a place with a rich history of flight testing advances. Established in the western Mojave Desert because of the area's unique blend of wide open spaces, clear skies, and abundant land, the base covers about 480 square miles of mostly intact desert habitat, an environment we are dedicated to conserve and required by law to maintain, so our military mission is sustainable into the future. An icon of this desert is the desert tortoise. The Mojave population of the desert tortoise, a federal and state threatened species, is a large land plant eating reptile found in portions of the California, Arizona, Nevada, and Utah deserts. The desert tortoise is considered an indicator species with respect to the health of the desert ecosystem. In general, desert tortoises are most active during spring and early summer when annual plants are growing and again in the fall as the males search for mates. However, tortoises may be found above ground during other seasons in pleasant weather and around rainstorm events. Desert tortoises spend much of their existence in burrows to escape extreme desert weather conditions. The desert tortoise can be found most anywhere on base. The majority of human-caused tortoise deaths occur when vehicles collide with tortoises on roadways or when a parked vehicle is moved and a sheltering tortoise is run over. Always look under your vehicle before moving it. It is illegal for anyone other than an authorized biologist to harass, touch, or move a tortoise unless it is in immediate danger. However, if a tortoise is found on a busy roadway and you determine it could be injured if not moved, move the tortoise out of harm's way as long as doing so does not put you at risk of injury. Approach the tortoise from the front Gently lift it with two hands while holding it level and place it 100 feet off the road, in the shade, and in the direction it was heading. Be sure to contact environmental management whenever a tortoise is seen or moved. While it is illegal to remove desert tortoises from the wild, Edwards Air Force Base has a desert tortoise adoption program for tortoises that have been cared for as pets for years and cannot be released into the wild. Releasing these tortoises into the wild could cause disease and death in the wild population. There are many animals living around us and among us, including owls, bobcats, squirrels, rabbits, spiders, scorpions, lizards, and snakes, to name a few. These animals are here because of our proximity to natural surroundings and are attracted to our neighborhoods because of food, water, and cover. You can reduce wildlife attractants by keeping trash can lids and dumpster lids closed, feeding pets indoors or when feeding pets outside removing food bowls immediately when done, preventing the buildup of bird feeder foods, limiting water outdoors such as bird baths, water bowls, and water features, keeping small pets indoors, especially from dusk to dawn, removing junk and brush from against fences and against buildings, and not feeding wild animals. What should you do if you encounter a wild animal? Watch and enjoy from a distance. Protect children and small pets by keeping them close. Don't feed the wildlife. Make eye contact. Look big. Make noise. Throw rocks and wave sticks. Spray water. Don't run away. You could get chased. The desert landscape, while rugged, is also very fragile. It can withstand extreme temperatures and drought, but can take over 100 years to recover from habitat disturbance. To prevent native habitat damage, stay on authorized trails and follow posted rules when enjoying outside activities such as motorized and non-motorized off-road vehicle use, hiking, hunting, and fishing. Do not disturb bird nests while eggs or baby birds are present. Leave cultural resources such as old dump sites, mines, and artifacts in place. Recycle glass, plastic, and aluminum. Don't put universal waste, like batteries, oil, electronic equipment and such, into the trash. And report hazardous waste to environmental management. 
Living and working at Edwards Air Force Base brings people and nature face to face. This wildland urban interface provides many opportunities for us to interact with the desert habitat and the animals inhabiting it. We can impact the natural environment around us for good by understanding it and respecting it. Hi, I'm Anna Kanglin. I work in the Office of Emergency Management and specifically in the planning section. Uh, today I get to talk to you about response. Uh, one of the very surprising things my office does that most people on the installation probably don't realize is that we have hazmat technicians within our office. Uh, we train as part of our in-house training program uh, to maintain these proficiency skills so that we can respond to different hazmat incidents in support of the fire department. Uh, we respond as follow-on responders. Uh, by the time we get to the scene, uh, the response has already begun. Uh, so typically when we get there, we already have some information. We can start narrowing down what kinds of equipment it is that we need to bring into the scene. Uh, one of my favorite elements that this office gets to participate in is actually our Seaburn Defense course that we offer the installation. We get a chance to impact almost every single military member that is leaving Edwards Air Force Base, going out on a variety of different deployments. Our class consists of uh, three main components. The first piece of our class is a very detailed academic PowerPoint instruction which shows the airmen um, every, all the different concepts to do with uh, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear hazards, as well as different delivery systems that the CBRN might be weaponized on. It takes them through a walkthrough of all of our gear. Uh, one element of the course is the actual M50 mask inspection. Uh, what students get to do during that portion is take their mask that they were issued, break it apart to its most basic element, inspect every little piece and part to that mask, and put it back together. Inspecting your M50 mask is one of the most important components of Seaburn Defense. Um, I've personally been uh, at deployed locations where you know military members showed up with uh, either faulty or missing pieces to their mask, and if they had been attacked, they would not have survived in that environment. Uh, it's so important that members know how to inspect their gear so that they can walk out of their home station down to a deployed environment with confidence that that gear is going to save them. Uh, last off in our class is actually um, our exercise component. This is where students get to do a demonstration performance piece of the class. And they are finding contamination, they are locating casualties, uh, treating them, putting their gas mask on them. Um, they're running through all of these different elements, such as finding new XOs, doing litter carries. Our exercise is where all of these self-aid and buddy care, all the uh, seaborne defense, all the different concepts that airmen learn um, in their wartime skills, all of that is brought together in that exercise So for the airmen to really understand how to use all of this training that they've received. For more information about how you and your family can be better prepared, make sure that you check out ready.gov or bready.af.mil for more information. Also, there is a great app that you can download for information on the go. Have a good day. This is Edwards Air Force Base home of the world's premier flight test center. And this is also Edwards. 481 square miles of harsh, unforgiving desert and yet a fragile ecosystem. Both the Air Force Test Center headquarters and the 412 test wing call Edwards home. The base has an extensive list of aviation accomplishments that, well, reads like a greatest hits list of worldwide aviation records going back 70 years. Virtually every aircraft in the Air Force inventory has proved itself in the skies above Edwards before it was fielded to the capable hands of the U.S. warfighter. It has often been said that if you want to see the Air Force of tomorrow, just look to the ramps of Edwards today. 
The driving force that built this legacy is the world-class test force, more than 10,000 people strong, from active duty military members to civilians and contractors. The base and its workers inject an estimated $1.6 billion a year into the local economy. A recent addition to this legacy is the operation of Air Force Plant 42 in nearby Palmdale, California, which now falls under the umbrella of the 412th Test Wing. Plant 42 is an Air Force-owned industrial plant that provides facilities, infrastructure, and all the services needed to assist military contractors to develop, produce, test, and maintain state-of-the-art weapon systems in direct support of the warfighter. Edwards is located near the western edge of the Mojave Desert. It is a land of coyotes and jackrabbits, of gnarled mesquite and Joshua trees. It is a stark land of stunning contrast, of griddle hot days and bone chilling nights, of violet storms and mesmerizing sunsets. It is also a land that seems almost custom made for testing aircraft. At the heart of the base lies Rogers Dry Lake, 44 miles of flat, dense, sandy clay. Nature makes the surface smooth and the sun bakes it hard. That makes it a perfect place for landing aircraft. It's a giant safety net for test pilots who sometimes push aircraft to their limits and may need a close, safe place to land in a hurry. The dry climate also makes for great flying weather, up to 360 days a year. Those two factors alone make Edwards a natural choice for flight test. But the use of these natural assets come with a responsibility to protect and preserve them. The desert requires us to pay special attention, which begins when people arrive at the base for the first time. Base biologists teach new residents and employees about this hostile yet fragile environment and the wildlife that live here. They focus on coyotes, bobcats, snakes, birds, sensitive plants, and the federally protected desert tortoise. Workers learn that part of our mission is protecting these natural resources to ensure we'll be able to continue our critically important mission of flight test. But it's not just the animals and plants that need to be protected. There are also many historical, prehistorical, and even geological sites that must be safeguarded as well. Archaeologists here manage more than 3,500 historical sites on base, some dating back to many thousands of years ago. Water is a scarce yet critical resource in the desert, and Edwards has been working hard at conserving water for decades. In 1996, forward-thinking base officials completed a state-of-the-art wastewater treatment plant. This treatment plant is capable of cleaning wastewater to near drinkable quality. Of course, the reclaimed water isn't used for drinking. Instead, it is used to water common use areas, such as the golf course, play parks, and the various sports and recreational fields on base. During its initial startup phase, the plant processed around 300 million gallons a year. Now, due to current conservation efforts, the base has reduced this to around 111 million gallons a year. One effort that has really helped drop water use has been the elimination of most of the grassy areas on base. In base housing and other high-use areas, grass has been replaced with xeriscaping and some low-use areas have been returned to the desert. Through these efforts, Edwards has reduced its potable water use from 2,945 acre-feet a year in 2007 to just 1,433 acre-feet in 2015. That's a 51% reduction. The conservation of water is only part of it. We're also taking steps to reduce our draw on the power grid. Most work areas have a policy of turning off lights and equipment when not in use and keeping rooms just a little cooler in the winter and a bit warmer in the summer. The base uses a system called the Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition System, or SCADA, to maximize efficiency of heating and air conditioning systems. Several large facilities have installed systems that freeze large volumes of water at night when demand for cooling is down and electricity rates are lower. Then, during the day, the air conditioning flows across this ice to cool the buildings. Many older buildings have had their roofs covered with white membranes to reduce absorption of thermal energy from the desert sun. 
and newer facilities have been built with enough energy saving features to meet the requirements for a leadership in energy and environmental design silver standard. These small steps, when combined, have had a significant effect on our energy use. Since 2003, the base has cut its energy use by 197 billion BTUs annually. That's equivalent to the energy used by 2,200 homes each year. Additionally, the Air Force has agreed to invest in upgrading our facility lighting to new, efficient LED systems. Once complete, these systems will save an estimated 15 million kilowatt hours per year, which is enough to power more than 1,386 average homes. Saving energy is good, but Edwards isn't stopping there. Producing renewable energy plays a part as well. 2012 saw the completion of three one megawatt solar farms on the installation, each on nearly eight acres of land. And here in the Mojave Desert, sunlight is plentiful. In 2015, these farms captured enough energy to power 595 homes and sent it into the power grid. Edwards is also pursuing plans to grant a lease for a large solar farm on a parcel of land in its northwest corner. This farm will generate as much as 400 megawatts. That will be enough power to supply 78,000 homes. It's scheduled to be completed as early as 2019. During the early history of Edwards, just as with other industrial facilities around America, people were much less aware of the harm done when fuels, oils, or solvents were spilled into the environment. From the 1950s through the 1980s, those spills went uninvestigated. Since the early 90s, the Edwards Environmental Restoration Program has worked to locate these spill sites and clean them up. To date, 472 contaminated sites have been identified, and 317 of those have been cleaned and declared safe for unlimited use. The program has spent $210 million so far and will spend an estimated $300 million to clean up the remaining sites. Various construction projects on the installation, such as replacing the 15,000-foot main runway, have left the base with hundreds of thousands of tons of broken concrete. Initial estimates show that it would take more than 10,000 truckloads to remove it all at a cost of more than $50 million. Instead, the crushed concrete will be used for a number of environmental restoration sites. This will keep desert wildlife from being exposed to contamination in the soil. One such use will remediate two old abandoned skeet shooting ranges. The concrete will be broken into a variety of sizes and spread across the ranges to cover them. Used the right way, the concrete will provide habitat for a variety of critters. At the same time, it breaks the potential pathway of lead shot to possible receptors, such as graveling birds and other small animals. On other sites, the concrete will be used as riprap to help reduce soil erosion and for fill material in areas where it's needed. Of course, the best way to ensure a clean environment is to prevent contamination in the first place. Some of the first actions Edwards took to be sure to stop future spills from happening was to look for other ways of accomplishing the mission without harmful chemicals, to design systems with better spill containment, to train workers how to quickly manage small spills, and to launch a pharmacy system that dispenses just the right amount of a needed solvent or other chemical, which keeps leftover chemicals out of the waste stream. After all, minimizing this waste stream is one of our primary goals. Another way the base keeps everyday materials out of another waste stream is through an active recycling program. The base diverts 20 to 30 percent of its solid waste stream through recycling, which returns money to the base through the sale of recyclables and keeps that material out of the base's landfill. Because Edwards contains so many different plant, wildlife, and geological resources, from large dry lake beds that act as a safety net for test pilots to the smaller playas and clay pans, from desert tortoise critical habitat or an oasis like Paiute Ponds to rare wind-shaped yardangs beyond Rogers Dry Lake's northeastern shore. We protect these resources. We also study them and partner with other agencies and academia to study them. 
We've hosted a number of environmental research projects over the years, and we've learned critical information about the effective management of the desert ecosystem through those efforts. From the results of this research, the Air Force receives valuable information about effective management of our desert ecosystem. Edwards has long been the leader of flight test, and decades of effective management, hard work, and innovation have proven we are a good neighbor and a leader in protecting the environment. We continue to effectively manage our precious, limited, shared resources to save water and power, to harness alternative energy, to clean up past mistakes, to actively and effectively oversee our stewardships. Our efforts to reduce, reuse, repurpose, and recycle through our daily operations are all part of protecting and preserving the great Mojave Desert that we call home. Edwards is the premier flight test facility in the world. It has no peer. Its continued mission is critical to ensure the United States can continue to fly, fight, and win against any enemy at any time. Its commitment to the environment will help ensure the base will effectively man that position today and tomorrow. Are you just going to hit record from the time they just take off? All the way there. Not on 4K. Because no, 4K won't last. Probably not. I probably tell them just to. I'll probably let them know, like in the back, just hey, can you just push power for that? You know, turn on. Dude, solid. So this whole thing will be gone, right? And I'll be shooting out here, and I can actually like punch in a little bit. Yeah. Just to get just the jet. But uh, yeah, in case you think it's too work. Five minutes, one more hold, and that's fine. 